And I would like to introduce the next speaker. Probably all of you already know him because he's one of the co-organizers. It's uh, Martin Hoffmann Apicius. He has a PhD in uh, molecular, molecular biology and worked for more than 10 years in experimental molecular biology. I'm not very familiar with pronouncing these terms from is it medicine or biology? <laughs> <laughs> and um, what makes him a little bit outstanding is that he has experiences in both areas, academia and research. And uh, this is why he is now working for a research organization which is right at the interface between academia and, and research, but still research-based, that is Fraunhofer Institute. He uh, has been leading the Department of Bioinformatics at the Fraunhofer Institute for Algorithms and Scientific Computing since 2002. And since 2006, he has been appointed um, as Professor for Applied Life Science Informatics at the Bonn Aachen International Center for Information Technology. Um, your talk um, will be addressing hypothetical knowledge and are more terms that I have problems to pronounce, so I give the word to you. It's your turn. What I'm going to talk about is, is um, something that, that Warren left out this morning, because that is scientific speculation. That is the gray zone of, of knowledge. Uh, he was talking about you know the factual stuff. I talk about the vague and uncertain stuff. Um, so there we are. Um, what the department in, at Sky is doing um, is actually we, we still work in information extraction. We, um, in, in, in contrast to Barnd, I think there is still a lot of work to be done. I'm going to show you what. Uh, but I, I share the notion, uh, actually, Darren, I share the notion that we see a transition from the technology driven, the F score voodoo stuff, you know, the, the I have an epsilon better than, than the others and so on, to the real applications. And that, that was necessary because for a long time people have been playing these S-score games and I, I never believed in that either. Um, so we have since about uh, four or five years, actually five years now, we have started to throw everything we knew here in that region, in that information extraction, onto uh, the problem that we all face because we are growing older and that's neurodegeneration, dementia. And all of you have a good chance to be at least half of you will, if you reach the 85, be demented by that time. So we better be fast with what we're doing because uh, there is currently no treatment, no cure. And it's a strong motivation on my side. Um, <clears throat> we do, we do uh, uh, play around with terminologies, ontologies, uh, in particular uh, causal relationships because we are interested in disease mechanisms and mechanisms are always causal relationships. Mm -hmm. And uh, we use something that's called Bell and I, I give, you, give you some more insight. But it's very much related to uh, the nano publications and the provenance principles are the same uh, that uh, Bauland mentioned this morning. Um, we also take care of scaling up these solutions or these, these uh, approaches basically to make them work on large amounts of uh, data and have it, have it really scalable. So the, the project that I'm currently running is, is one out of three big projects of the Innovative Medicine Initiative in the area of dementia research. And uh, Echonomy is about generating a mechanism-based taxonomy of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. We keep the focus on Alzheimer here. And uh, as said, I mean, uh, when we talk about mechanisms, it's something that actually the, uh, means a dramatic change in, in the way how medical doctors look at diseases. Because so far from the 18, 1850, from 1850, around 1850, um, the, this is when, when medical doctors started to develop the taxonomy of disease as we know it. And that's a taxonomy that has been, has been built by classifying clinical readouts, appearance of a patient, like a, how does a patient appear in a, in a hospital. And it has nothing to do really with the molecular mechanisms um, that are underlying and that we understand now much better since the last 40 years or so we are doing molecular biology since the last 20 years we're doing genomics and uh, 
And uh, that is changing basically the way we look at disease. And it's now a task to basically overcome a traditional categorization and classification system and uh, to establish something that is mechanism-based. Now, the, the idea that we're following is that we have a lot of different readouts, including uh, ontologies or stuff that is going on at the protein level that includes functional units like pathways. There's in the neurology field, there's a lot of neuroimaging, for instance, there's gene expression stuff and so on. And all these data resources together in a sort of synopsis, in a, in a system-oriented approach, are then establishing something that is a mechanism. The question, of course, is um, we have a couple of measurable features, measurable features, and we want to use them for stratification of patients. We want to group patients according to the disease mechanism, the underlying disease mechanisms, and there might be more than one. There is strong evidence that in Alzheimer we are having something like 10 to 15 to 20 different ways to develop Alzheimer. Uh, the question is, how do you combine those measurables to, you know, make the classification? And the biggest problem we face, actually, in all biomedicine is that there's not a single coherent data set covering all these aspects. You know, you, have, you don't have from the same patient all the genome, all the gene expression, all that is going on at the protein level, the metabolic level, the clinical level, and there's nothing that really bridges between all these levels. So what, what are we going to do? Uh, we produce, um, or we, we, we take an approach to systematically capture and model the knowledge on Alzheimer's disease, the knowledge that has been generated at the various levels here independently. It has, of course, a couple of limitations because uh, the coherence itself of a, of, a, uh, of a measurement through and through all, over all levels would have been extreme benefits. You know, we would have, we would have great insights, but it, that's not possible, as said. So one way to go, one route to take is basically to systematically capture and model the knowledge on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we have been doing that in the beginning also with a more classical way, developing the Alzheimer disease ontology, which is at a high resolution, capturing, representing the domain knowledge. We did that together with one of the leading neurologists here in Germany in that field. Um, and that is something where we, where we achieve two goals. One is we generate something like a, a semantic framework for Alzheimer's research. Um, we allow people to map their wording, their terminology, to a referential terminology, and we have a terminology that we can use for text mining approaches, for instance. We have then started actually to turn not only literature, but also, uh, for instance, cartoons, so real, real um, cartoon-like representations of knowledge. And there's quite a lot of knowledge actually in drawing, schematic drawings. There's a lot of understanding coming with this sort of representation which cannot easily be <clears throat> mined by machines. And uh, also from, from, from databases, we have, we have used that to represent it in a syntax that is tailored to represent causal relationships. And we have produced, well, how did you call that? A, a, a ridiculous term. So uh, we, I would call that a computable model, because it's really something, and that's, that is, no, no, Bart was completely right. A human being cannot read that anymore. And you cannot reason as a human over that graph. I mean, I have one person in my group who can. Alpha can, she's, she's generating those models, she can reason over such a model, but she's the only person <laughs> in the entire department. Bell is something, as I said, is a, is a syntax, basically, that allows you to formalize um, this, 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 you know, uh, type of natural language communication of some biological process. As you see here, that's the sentence, phosphorylation of glycogen, gly glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta at 3 and 668 increases the degradation of amyloid precursor protein. A very strange sentence, but uh, quite common in that domain. So it's for a Alzheimer research person, it's actually trivial. And this is the way how we represent that using the Bell syntax. 
it distinguishes functions, namespace identifiers, it, try, it tries or it requires that you map all the terms to a reference, to an ontology or to a namespace identifier that typically comes uh, from referential databases, for instance. And entity definitions, uh, you, point at, you point at a nomenclature, for instance, here the human genome nom uh, nomenclature. And you, you have functions like modification and degradation and so on. Bell, like the, the, the nano publications and the assertions that uh, Barrent already introduced, forms graphs. And you can actually generate really huge graphs with that. Uh, the subject predicate object, uh, here subject predicate object um, triple actually forms uh, is, is the fundamental, is the fundamental, here's the subject, the predicate, the object. One object can be the subject of the next triple. Um, those, those triples uh, can, can become really m impressively large uh, networks. And in the, the particular, uh, or, or rather special feature of Bell is um, that that it is uh, representing causal relationships. And reasoning over causal relationships becomes a graph traversal. So that is one of those hairballs, or actually two of them, uh, that we have produced. That is now accepted for publication since two weeks or so, or one, 10 days. Uh, the paper was one year in revision, and two revisions and so on. Because uh, one of the other things, phenomena that we observe is that neurologists are not prepared to think in these models. They are not used to communicate in, in these models, and they really don't understand what it's all about. What we also see is we do a lot more research, obviously, here on the disease state than on the normal state. That, that, that densely populated graph is what the, the diseased neuron is doing. These are all causal relationships we know about the diseased neuron. This is what we know about the normal physiology of a neuron. And that, see, that, that actually makes, as graph density, visible how biased our research is. What we also see is that there are two centers. Yeah, these two centers, you see, dense, dense hubs. <clears throat> these are the two PET molecules that all the biomedical, 95% of all biomedical researchers in this field, in the Alzheimer research, work on APP or tau. APP or tau, tau or APP. 95% of all people write grants on all that. There's much more outside, but when you look into what the pharmaceutical industry targets what they work on, APP and tau, tau and APP. And nothing of, none, none of those two targets works. So 10 years of pharmaceutical research have been basically wasted so far on APP and tau. Question is, are APP and tau alternative laws? Personally, I hate if people make themselves fools when they say that something is alternative laws. I completely disagree. I mean, we have always alternatives, irrespective of whether it's in politics or in biomedicine. So basically, what Ashutosh Malhotra and my team developed was uh, a, an approach to find, to identify systematically uh, alternatives. People were speculating that something could be, you know, outside of the well-established. We did that to get an overview on current hypothesis proposed by scientists about mo disease, uh, molecular signatures of Alzheimer's disease. Um, we want to generate then uh, models actually of the um, not fully established knowledge and uh, see whether we can predict based on those models uh, emerging biomarkers. So using emerging knowledge, not solidified, not rock solid knowledge to point at uh, new possible candidates that are worth looking at. And we did that uh, by using actually the Alzheimer disease ontology as a terminology in our text mining tool. This is one of these highlighting games that we also play. Uh, we had, uh, we developed a, well, Ashutosh did that, um, a set of regular expressions, which is, um, 
which are systematically capturing what people use, the terminology that people use or the expressions that they use uh, to express scientific speculation in text. So things like might be involved, may influence, may favor, uh, may help or may confer something or even might not. Um, all these, these expressions are systematically captured by what he calls hypothesis finder. And he has combined that um, to capture in particular the, the hypothesis in the world of genes and proteins. Um, so it's a, it's a triple combination of a terminology capturing the knowledge, the domain of Alzheimer, the hypothesis finder that is, that is uh, collecting uh, speculative statements, and the human gene and protein dictionary, and then he did a systematic analysis of all the Medline stuff and the PubMed Central. So typically we uh, mine, um, to a large extent, abstracts and, and wherever it's possible and freely available um, full text. And he came up actually with a staged model of Alzheimer because there's a mild Alzheimer and a moderate and a severe. And these, these um, stages can be distinguished in the literature. And he came up with a couple of entities that he identified that are, have been speculated. And when you look into that, the distributions, you see um, approximately the same distributions here um, for the hypothesis and the proteins that are linked to the hypothesis. So it's almost the same uh, distribution. So there's a quite a lot of novelty, basically, in it. There's a lot of reports that are singletons, basically, so to speak, and uh, that put a gene that had no attention so far into a new context. And to put it into a new context, you basically put it into a model. We benchmarked uh, that approach and uh, against the human, um, a human uh, expert database, a human curated database that has the name Altswan, uh, generated by our friend and colleague Tim Clark at Harvard. And uh, they are doing essentially the same with human expertise. So people are reading, looking for um, uh, publications where people speculate and they were systematically collecting a hypothesis uh, on Alzheimer uh, and irrespective of whether you look at uh, genes and proteins or the number of hypotheses themselves, uh, the machine actually, and that's already curated here, so that's tested, uh, brings back more um, hypotheses or more uh, genes and proteins. Uh, and the machine could easily uh, distinguish between the different stages with what um, that's something that Altswan doesn't do. Tim was the reviewer of that paper. That's why it took so long <laughs> to get it through. But ultimately, no, no, he's fair. Tim is very fair. And, and ultimately, he said, OK, that's good. Um, yeah, and it's freely available. If you're interested in mining in your domain, scientific speculation, um, Go to PLOS Computational Biology, and there you have all the links, and we can also support you in, in applying that to your problem. Now, what we, what we did in addition now is really putting this speculation into context, in functional context, for the different stages here. And we have, uh, we have generated protein-protein interaction networks specific for those, for those uh, clinical stages and heavily enriched for um, speculative protein interactions. This is how it looks like. And then Ashu was also looking for uh, an enrichment of uh, putative biomarkers. Biomarkers are measurables in the, in the clinical context um, that have some predictive value. And with the, um, with the biomarker terminology and the Alzheimer's disease ontology that describes or sets the scope of the uh, uh, Alzheimer knowledge domain, and again, the human protein dictionary, we were generating a uh, network of biomarkers that are proteins or genes. And with an overlay of the known biomarkers to the network of proteins, of speculated proteins, or biomarkers, we could come up with candidate biomarkers that, candidate biomarkers that are candidates, that are new candidates for 
um, clinical readouts with predictive value. That this is what the pharmaceutical industry, for instance, loves to have to look into new emerging uh, measurables that because a lot of those guys here are well known and the limitations of those are also known and, um, and people are interested in, in finding new uh, measurables that could also serve as a new uh, target for an uh, interventional approach. And Ashu actually came up with uh, four new very promising um, candidate biomarkers that are all from this region here. This is the well-known stuff. And this is the emerging potential candidates um, these are the usual suspects, actually. If you're in the Alzheimer domain, these are the quite well-known usual suspects. Uh, and funny enough, I mean, this, this, uh, most of that work was done uh, a while ago now. Uh, funny enough, one of those markers in the meanwhile is undergoing a clinical trial uh, for validation, for biomarker validation. So it has been picked up by somebody else, um, but we, we basically see that as a confirmation of the uh, mining approach. And what we also did was we generated, again, Bell models representing causal relationships of something that is speculative. So we put mechanistic, or we put uh, speculation into a mechanistic context. And for the better readability of this graph, uh, by, by medical doctors and biologists, we draw them also as cartoons because this is the way how medical doctors uh, actually uh, understand complicated stuff like that. They would not be able to read that. So with that, I would like to give you a couple of take-home messages. One is that it's uh, still a good idea to uh, invest time and effort into the building of terminologies, ontologies, because they are um, playing an important role as semantic invariables in a given knowledge domain. And as I said, um, the Alzheimer's disease ontology is a high resolution representation of knowledge in the uh, domain. Knowledge can be captured and represented in a systematic fashion using a dedicated knowledge modeling syntax. Uh, OpenBell is one example, and the nano publications that Barrent were, was mentioning this morning is another one. Uh, there's also certain algorithms and, and even um, uh, software frameworks coming with those uh, um, um, modeling um, languages and syntax that allows and supports uh, reasoning, for instance. Um, systematic enrichment of scientific speculation allows us, allows us to mine the gray zone of published knowledge, so looking into emerging stuff, for instance, emerging uh, putative potential candidate molecules and, and distinguishing, you know, the old, well-established stuff from the novel stuff. That is basically uh, possible with the approach that I outlined. And uh, we can model that hypothetical knowledge and put it even into a functional context and perform model validation using existing data. That is an interesting aspect that we are following currently because with those knowledge representations in the models, we can actually challenge the available data. We have heard about data and the need to you know, share data, to cite data, to make data available. Um, and uh, uh, in particular in the field of Alzheimer's research, there is data, but it's very likely that all the data we have is rather useless. And uh, because simply because they typically from post-mortem people, which means um, they have been taken, the human brain has been taken from dead people after, you know, six hours, up to 20 hours or so after death. Uh, what you measure there is an endpoint of somebody who died with dementia at 90 or so. However, the dementia started 30, 35 years before, maybe 40 years before. And you have no clue what the early dysregulation events were. So it's very likely that we can show, actually, that uh, the current data that we have in neurology are unlikely to help us solving the problem of uh, prevention or treatment of dementia. Okay, and with that, I would like just to acknowledge who is behind uh, Etionomy. Etionomy is still running three and a half years from now, more than three and a half years from now. I'm very excited. Uh, we, together with two other projects, building the largest Alzheimer's research infrastructure worldwide so far. 
And with that, I thank you for your attention and happy to take questions. Thank you.